Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carl Larson from RM Consulting Group, your facilitator for the webinar. Uh, at the cutting edge, advancements in integrated crop protection for profitable vegetable production. And this afternoon, we're really excited to be joined by a range of international experts and speakers. Um, which we're really looking forward to getting stuck into the detail. But look, before we do, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't joined uh, one of our sessions before or the GoTo webinar panel, um, I'm assuming some of you have uh, due to this little thing called coronavirus and everyone living on their laptops or computers for the last 18 months. But you'll see uh, the GoTo webinar control panel on your screen there which is really uh, your portal to the session. So you can type in questions as we go through the presentations, they'll come directly to me and we can put them to our panel at the end of the session. Um, and there's also a range of really handy resources there in the handouts pane um, as PDFs, which you can download and take away with you straight away, including a, uh, an IPM global scan looking at some of the drivers and regulatory changes in Europe, um, which is hot off the press as of this morning um, and exclusive to, to this audience today. So we're really pleased to bring you that. Um, just a, a little bit of an overview about what uh, we're gonna cover today. We're gonna look at the advancements and lessons in ICP from Europe um, and also, uh, investigate ways to build integrated crop protection into your current pr um, production system and looking at some tips and tools um, to do that as well and uh, also what some of those benefits are to transitioning to an ICP approach. We're going to have plenty of time for questions and interacting uh, with our presenters and panellists as well um, but before we do kick off and just to give us a, a bit of an understanding about who's on the line. I'm just gonna launch a quick poll which will come up on your screen now as a multiple choice question. Just asking you how much experience you've got in integrated crop protection in vegetable production. You can select one of the four options there. Um, it just gives us a bit of an idea about where to pitch the information um, and also uh, just be careful with things like acronyms, particularly with technical content, they can be pretty uh, laden with those things and, and jargonistics. So that's just in progress at the moment with about 80% of us voted, which is great. Thank you for participating. So I'm gonna close that now and just share back the results uh, really for our presenters to show who's on the line. So we've got um, over half of us on the line with not much experience, which is great. That's, I'm glad you could join us. Um, a few there, about a fifth with lots. Um, 10% with a bit and 10% with none, but keen to know more. So look, thank you very much for participating in that. Um, I'm going to now just give a quick overview of the Soil Wealth and ICP project, which is bringing you this webinar today. This is uh, an extension based project around getting research onto farms to improve soil management and plant health. It's been running since 2014 nationally. Um, and really responding to industry needs around those two key areas. And we do this through demonstration sites and practically getting uh, research and development in the hands of growers, running events like today, but also farm walks and other, other um, technical training like masterclasses. We just had um, a masterclass last week on soil biology over two days and a range of resources like the ones in your handout pane to the right hand side of your screen today. So that's enough from me. Um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Martin Zadowak from Biobest Group in the Netherlands. Um, Martin is the technical director um, of support services and manages a team of enthusiastic IPM and pollination specialists. So I'll hand over uh, to Martin's screen now and he can take us through the first part of the webinar. Martin, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, let's see if... Oh. This should work. I think that everyone can see my screen. Excellent, we can see that now. Great work. Well, first of all, thank you for participating in this uh, exciting webinar. Uh, it, it's always... Uh, 
good and, and exciting to talk about um, IPM or uh, ICP as it's uh, as, as the it's called in um, in Australia what what we call integrated pest management. I will get back to that uh, in much more detail later on. My name is Martin Zadwijk, working for BioBest as uh, and, and leading the, the the technical team, servicing uh, roughly 400 technicians uh, in the field. So our job is train train those uh, to uh, yeah to help. Uh, the farmer, the grower, as much as possible. Uh, I'm in the business for, well, since 1992 and, and always been in the uh, crop protection uh, business. So let me uh, give you a brief introduction of our company. Uh, we started in uh, 1987, um, Biovest, and, and at that time, the Founder was focused on bumblebee uh, uh, breeding for pollination in tomatoes and strawberries. Nowadays, we are in uh, more than 70 countries present. We have a team of 1,700 employees. And our toolkit, as I call it, is uh, not just pollination anymore. It's a, a broad range of uh, beneficial insects and mites. Um, we also have a range of biopesticides. Besides the product range you need to have, uh, it's also um, critical for success to, to monitor in your crop and therefore we created uh, certain tools, digital tools and, and, and the, what we call the old-fashioned sticky traps, but still very practical. And last but not least, the high-tech IPM uh, that has uh, to do with big data, artificial intelligence, and so on, is getting much more uh, of a priority within our organization and uh, the application. Within Australia, we have uh, uh, two representatives here, that's uh, Bugs for Bugs and Biological Services. So what is um, integrated pest management or ICP, eh? although the title refers to just pest, uh, we have to realize that it's more than pest, it's also diseases and, and everything. So it's a holistic approach, but this is the European uh, uh, wording uh, of, of the system, but it equals to ICP in, in Australia. So uh, if you want to get into IPM, as we call, then uh, it, it's, well, there is a certain uh, approach you need to do. And first of all is, of course, prevention. You want to prevent the uh, um, harm for insects and disease to get into your crop. Um, you can do it with different, in different ways, cultural methods, uh, uh, soil life, crop rotation, and so on. Um, host plant resistance. Uh, think about uh, resistant varieties, for example. Uh, but also biological conservation, which more or less means, well, um, create a, a, the conditions for the good bugs or the good fungus uh, in your soil, in your crop, uh, from surrounding areas. Um, that's the start. And secondly, you need to understand what's in your crop, what are your the battles to to fight for. So therefore, scouting is quite important and with the uh, current AI artificial intelligence uh, possibilities, we are uh, uh, working towards a system that can forecast your pest on, on a very local uh, way. Um, once you know what's, what's in the crop, uh, then there are also, uh, be, and before you start spraying as a last resort, uh, there are also, uh, um, what we call semiochemicals or physical control, where you uh, practically trap uh, the insect on a sticky trap, or uh, you create a situation that uh, the males can't find the females and therefore they can't mate and uh, they don't have any, well, they, they don't lay any eggs and you don't have new, the new generation. So, um, Using all this based on scouting, once it's necessary, well, then uh, we need to use pesticides. But even then, you try to find a very selective one so you're not killing all the good bugs in your crop. 
the transition to IPM is uh, first to, to start with reducing the number of harsh chemicals, uh, then uh, and, and replace with the more selective ones. And once you have the tools and more experience, well, then it's redesigning the strategy. And this is something I will uh, pick up uh, today. But first of all, the, uh, the, the situation in uh, Europe. Um, if you look to the greenhouse business, then more than 70% of the greenhouse crops are using uh, beneficial insects driven by uh, residue uh, levels. And well, I'm, I will get back to that later. Um, these are high value crop, and uh, that's a, a big difference with the outdoor crops where we just have 8% organic growth. There is also um, IPM uh, uh, used in, in Europe, but the uptake is much lower, and that's due to what we call low value uh, crops. The outdoor uh, farmers, uh, they are focusing mainly on the biological conservation at the moment, soil enhancement, uh, so uh, making sure that the, that, that the plant has no uh, restrictions uh, to, to, to grow and, and can be a strong plant. Uh, monitoring, of course, precision farming, it's uh, uh, much more uptake, not just in, in distribution fertilizer, but just also monitoring pests and diseases. Um, of course, crop rotation, but that's not a new thing, and that, that's uh, an old practice, but still important. And we believe that uh, if you look to the IPM system, where in the greenhouse we are more, mainly focused on biological control agents, uh, like uh, beneficial insects, outdoors it will be mainly pesticides and biostimulants we believe that will uh, uh, bring the solutions uh, joint forces i put it in here because um and i will discuss about it later um we only get this result within europe by uh, joining forces as growers as organizations as research as consultants uh, if we would like to uh, do it individually then um well you you set yourself back with one or two nil uh, because that that's that's not bringing up the speed in the um evolution and development of ipm uh, before i go into the drivers of uh, how, what, what what drives growers farmers to to start ipm uh, i want to explain the green deal which is a project within the european union uh, which is focused on reducing and preventing pollution of air, water, soil, and food. Um, but if we, so, but it's more than just crop protection, and it's more than just the agricultural uh, uh, sector. Uh, but if we focus on crop protection, then the target for the farmers and growers in Europe is to reduce the pesticide with 50%, and that 25% of the agricultural area should be organically grown and so this is our target for the coming nine nine years um the european union is not waiting till we do something uh, they really are uh, enforcing the farmers uh, to to look for alternative solutions uh, uh, the the current pesticides available will be will be re-evaluated um there will be a restriction of numbers of treatments so you can only use a certain product once or twice or five times a year um new products it, there will be a stricter process to to allow new products on the market <clears throat> also in the application technology uh, they will ban any um, uh, plain treatments and yeah the maximum residue levels which is a uh, standard for uh, uh, on, on, on uh, food crops, uh, not just food crops, also on ornamental crops. Uh, they will bring that uh, down as well. Besides the overall uh, EU, also each member state is obliged to develop an action plan uh, to come with quantitative objectives, targets, and so on. So it's, uh, there's quite some pressure on the business currently. If we look to the past, what, what would be and what were, uh, sorry, the, the drivers for uh, um, IPM. 
first of all, it's licensed to produce uh, based on legislation. Eh? If you don't have the availability of uh, pesticides anymore, then you need to find solutions. Um, and and uh, but also, when I was talking about the maximum uh, residue levels, the uh, EU is um, 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 setting. Um, sorry for that. Um, also, the retail is uh, making it even harder to say, well, okay, we just allow products and you can deliver to us if the maximum residue level is 30% of what's allowed in Europe. So that, that's quite a difference. Um, then the ability to produce, um, even if the products are available in your toolkit, yeah, then uh, the products could have uh, resist or uh, the, the insects could have resistance to those certain products or your cropping system is in that dense that you are not getting with your spray techniques inside the canopy where uh, uh, the, the aphids or the pests are. So the treatment is not effective. Uh, another big change uh, and, and, and driver for IPM is the use of, ben of uh, bumblebees in tomato and strawberries. Uh, by using uh, uh, those helpers, uh, those pollinators, um, well, it means that you have a restriction on the pesticides you can use. So, so that is also a, a big driver. Nowadays, we see some good examples uh, in potato crops with aphid control, with uh, spider mite control, etc. But there are some more examples to, to talk about later. Of course, the safety for the applicant in greenhouses, uh, that's, that's also a driver, more and more a driver, and also for the consumer. And we noticed that uh, reducing your pesticides, yeah, uh, we often underestimate the impact it has on the growth of, uh, of your crop. And we have seen uh, increases, yield increase by 10 to 20% by just stop using um, the pesticides. So if we think about, do we want to start using IPM? Do we want to go into that? Well, then um, the question is, what well, do you want to be enforced? Huh? So waiting till we need to do, um, or uh, would you like to be in the driver's seat? And I certainly recommend to you not to wait and, and, and see what happened until someone is telling you what to do. But please already look for your situation, for your crop, what you can do and, and just, just start. But how do we start? The, it, it's a very simple method. Uh, I experienced myself and, and when talking to growers, yeah, there are just three uh, criteria which are uh, critical for, for, for success, uh, which is motivating that's uh, the first one uh, why do you want to start uh, it should be part of the company strategy it's not something that you do together with and anything else uh, let, let's do a certain project it should be really in the strategy of the company to um, change into ipm because it takes investments and learning and if uh, well you are not willing to go through that learning path well, then you should wonder, will it be successful and then should I start? And because it's a mindset change as well. It's not reactive. It's not, let's pray every so many days. It's really uh, uh, proactive and, uh, uh, and, and, and planning. So that's, that's a big change. Then monitoring, I think it will speak for itself, but what do we have, where it is, quantity involvement, uh, use the correct tools uh, we have a crop scanner developed especially for this uh, but also look not just to your pest but also look to the regulatory requirements uh, so what's happening over there and then the third pillar in this success uh, pie is, is uh, create and develop your strategy your recipe education of staff everyone involved in <clears throat> the growing part uh, should know what you are doing. Meet your peers again. Don't do it by yourself. Learn from others, but also exchange and get in more depth. And then trial and, and innovate. 
<clears throat> so what are tips and tricks for, for when you want to start with, with IPM? Uh, first of all, get the expertise from uh, uh, suppliers, from IPM experts, but also universities and research together in the field. Uh, I often say bring the, uh, uh, the, the practical experience together with the academy, academic experience and, and expertise together, but in the field, it's quite difficult to develop a program from an office. Start small, uh, small area and step by step. Don't take your full um, test at once. Just start with one and then take another one. Huh? And it makes it manageable. It makes also the financial risks lower. Develop and implementation takes time. So uh, you often are um, restricted by, by seasons or crop cycles. And take care of, of the natural occurring biocontrol. So how can you, uh, by using selective pesticides, for example, can you keep them alive and, and help you doing the job? Create a sharing platform with your peers, uh, but uh, um, and, and to evaluate your Thoughts. And I know that sometimes uh, it's difficult to communicate about this, but here I really uh, would recommend to, as it is not just an individual problem or, or a challenge, it's a sector challenge, uh, find each other and, and help each other. Of course, funding helps. Uh, maybe levies can be used for uh, uh, business overstating uh, um, uh, solutions. Uh, communicate with regulators. Uh, if they don't know what your problems are, they, they will set their uh, uh, regula uh, regulation. So it's always good to be in communication with them uh, so you understand their uh, situation and they will understand yours. And <clears throat> last but not least, be in a driver's seat. And I've said that before, but again, do it together. So what can be your... Uh, First uh, steps, and uh, um, I would say first you need to get the center right, eh? the motivation, monitoring, and the method. Then choose your battle. Eh? Start small, one pest, uh, small plot, develop the strategy, get educated, and and and, and get technical support frequently. Um, find a reliable uh, supply partner uh, we know that when you deal with living products uh, uh, it's not just uh, delivery from the shelf this is planning this is bring it in good condition to your farm then um, evaluation uh, evaluate what you have done innovate where you find new gaps and well then uh, choose the next battle and um, what I said, start small. You can start with monitoring. You can start with a, uh, choosing selective pesticides. You can start with working on your soil, soil enhancement, and so on. So just keep it small, then the, the success for the big picture will follow by itself. Just for some inspiration, um, what 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 we already uh, have successes with and and you will see it's mainly uh, um, insects oriented yet but for sure the the, the, the fungal and the diseases will follow up uh, soon but there are certainly um, opportunities uh, here where you and, and maybe one of those is something you can uh, start with it's always good to have some first experience This is um, the presentation and, and, and the information I would like to share uh, uh, with you. Um, I hope it makes sense. We can talk well, for weeks about IPM, and this is just high level, very general, but we are uh, after the meeting or in the future, always welcome to uh, help you further on. So uh, thank you very much for listening and watching and uh, success with your roadmap into IPM or ICP. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Martin, for providing those insights based on the European um, experience. I particularly love your um, success pie of motivation, uh, method and monitoring. That's uh, a really nice uh, 
little acronym of triple M to keep in the back pocket there when we're talking about this. I'm going to pass to our uh, next presenter and while uh, Danielle's bringing up her slides on the screen, Danielle Park is from Ausveg, who's the coordinator of the EnviroVeg program, which is an industry-led environmental best management practice program. Um, EnviroVeg provides technical resources and through completion of a self-assessment allows benchmark data for vegetable production businesses to track performance. Danielle, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, Carl. Just confirming you can see my slides there. We can, thanks. Perfect. Excellent. So, so as Carl said, my name is Danielle Park. Um, I work with Ausveg, uh, and my role is the program coordinator for the Enviroveg program. So, I just wanted today to provide a bit of an overview. Um, of the EnviroVeg program, uh, specifically looking at some of the components that are included in that program when it comes to insect, pest, disease and weed management. Um, the EnviroVeg program is a national program and it's, it's moved recently to an online uh, platform which allows us to um, do some really interesting things when it comes to benchmarking practice and also understanding what practices are occurring in what regions and in what crop types. So I just sort of thought I'd provide a bit of an overview of how this might link in with the uh, IPM or uh, ICP or ICM. There's a lot of acronyms and uh, yes, uh, just to sort of see where things are going. So just as a bit of an overview, uh, EnviroVeg uh, uh, is, uh, is, about is about industry representation. Um, it's industry-led and supports and promotes uh, environmental best practice techniques. It provides technical resources and produces benchmark data for vegetable production businesses to track performance. The program has had a long history uh, with vegetable producers. The inception of the program came about with a number of growers uh, many years ago traveling to Europe and learning around the, the LEAF program. More recently, we've had growers who have been looking at uh, programs like Red Tractor, for example, looking to show how they might be able to get some uh, recognition for the good work that they are doing. The program is supported through the Hort Innovation Vegetable Levy Fund, um, and it's an important process of providing access to best management information. A really fundamental piece to the program is that it's underpinned uh, by an environmental management practice resource. So we have technical resources that are able to sort of provide a guide to what current uh, research is occurring that you might be able to utilise in your farming system. Uh, it uses up-to-date information through uh, to support sustainable growing techniques and approaches. The program is very much around improvement. It's about understanding uh, where a production system is currently operating and helping to prioritise what the next uh, element might need to be addressed to improve practice on farm. As I said before, we've recently moved to an online platform. So we link through to a program called Hort 360, uh, which is housed within a, a group called Growcom in Queensland. Um, the benefit for that is that anybody who's operating in the Queensland system, their data is moved from one system to the other and reduces that duplication. With Queensland having quite a lot of regulation around environmental management, when it comes to the Great Barrier Reef, this is a really big sort of opportunity to streamline that process. The first step in the program is to complete this online self-assessment just to understand what practices are currently occurring. Um, and allow people to understand where the next thing they might want to look to improve is. The final part of the program is to go through to certification. So the EnviroVeg program provides a pathway to fresh care environmental certification. So we link through to a third party auditor to give the program some teeth. Um, and this option to progress to certification grants access to EnviroVeg branding branding to allow for recognition for those vegetable growing businesses who want to show that they are responsible stewards of land, water and biodiversity. So the program was reimagined or re-reviewed in 2019 and opened in 2020. 
So time-wise, uh, a little tricky in terms of when we sort of commenced, but we are seeing growers proceed through this final stage, complete their audits once their uh, travel, travel restrictions allow those to occur and starting to get that sort of move through to the branding piece of the, of the program. So as I flagged at the beginning, the EnviroVeg program does encompass a number of elements specific to today's topic, looking at insect, pest, disease and weed management. So just to sort of pull out a little bit of the detail of to, as to what the program includes, we include elements in the chemical management space, which probably most directly um, speak to this. EnviroVeg is very much around ensuring that growers are adhering to their legal requirements. We are a national program. Those legal requirements do differ state to state. So there's a lot of sort of work in there to ensure that we are um, checking to make sure that growers are enc encompassing all of the, the components specific to their region. Um, we're looking to make sure that the selection, purchase and transport of chemicals occurs appropriately. And we're looking to review the production system to identify opportunities to minimise chemical use. So it's very much starting from that making sure you're meeting your requirements, going through that process of storage, transport, training of staff and the like, through to actually identifying what you need to do to minimise. We do capture knowledge and practices that relate to IPM in our chemical management section, specifically talking about knowledge of beneficial insects for, particular, for the crops that people are growing, and also for pest monitoring and use of IPM. That pest monitoring piece is important. So speaking about pest monitoring, on-farm biosecurity is a component we include within the program. It speaks very much to the management of biosecurity on the property, the monitoring and reporting of unusual findings, but embedded within that is the monitoring and reporting of all findings when it comes to pest and disease. That capture and monitoring is actually a, is a component that does feed into this IPM story. And the final piece, which perhaps initially doesn't sort of stand out, is the biodiversity improvement space. <coughs> the EnviroEdge program looks to manage, to encourage growers to manage biodiversity on their property and to develop strategies to protect and improve that. Part of that is about capturing knowledge of biodiversity assets already within the system and practices to manage invasive weeds, including integrated weed management plans. One of the pieces we often speak to with the program when we are identifying opportunities for improvement is potential opportunity for native vegetation to be homes for beneficial insects. We're looking for that win-win. So where we might find an opportunity to both get a biodiversity outcome, as well as potentially providing an opportunity for integrated pest management host plants. So that's a really sort of interesting piece of work and there's some trial work going on in certain locations uh, around Australia. To provide, provide a bit of an example, um, I've just, as I said before, we do capture practice data um, online in the current version of the program. So just to provide a really sort of short piece of information about what we capture. This is just a really rough um, data. Unfortunately, I, I can't sort of split it out at the moment to, to the state level. I do, we do require um, levels to allow for anonymity. Um, but here's an example question we ask. To reduce pesticide use on farm, do you use any integrated pest management methods? And what we've found is that 40% are using it only occasionally. So sometimes that may mean that for their particular crops, they might not be able to use it all of the time, or they might be putting, might be trialling in that trial phase. 10% have not considered it at all. We're looking at 20% who are using a full complement of IPM measures uh, with some control strategies and then finally a full complement, oops, sorry, I'll just go back. Uh, a full 30% are using the full complement of IPM methods and they're seeking improvement. So they are looking to actively improve what they're currently doing. Um, please take note that as I sort of flagged at the beginning, this program was reviewed back in 2019 uh, and was rolled out in, in 2020. That has meant that the, the producers that have most heavily engaged in the program early are often those with um, either a, a great deal of passion uh, for the EnviroVeg program or those that are larger and are using it as either a staff training 
um, for uh, um, a risk management approach to their business. So we do find that we are tending to skew a little bit to sort of larger producers. Uh, for example, uh, the 20% that are using the full complement of IPM measures tend to be in that 250 to 300 hectares as an average. Now that ranges quite a way around that, but just to show that that's the sort of scale we're sort of talking about there. So the final piece I'll just show you now. So this is an indication of some benchmarking capability in the program. You can see there that the blue bars show between 75 and 25%, so the majority of practices. Um, the top bar so is showing the maximum score and the minimum is the bottom. This doesn't pull out those IPM components, but it does show you where um, growers are sitting on average across the bar. Just remember, as I said, we have tended to have those people who are um, more, uh, more eager to get into this space during a pandemic. So, it does show you that it's something that's driving them quite a lot. What you can see there is the red dot shows where a, an individual grower sits relative to others involved in this program. Um, what we've found is that that has been a really strong incentive for some growers to address areas that they might not have sort of seen as a priority because the competition, uh, the competitive spirit uh, comes in and we do find we are having more conversations uh, around topic areas that uh, I was not expecting when I began working on this program. So I think that's uh, the end of my presentation. So I'll hand it back to Carl. Fantastic. Thanks, Danielle, for your insights there on the EnviroVeg program. So we've covered the international perspective and looking at some of the drivers uh, in Europe and then looking at some of the tools available to us on our own shores domestically. We'd like to now open up to the panel session um, and we've also um, a very warm welcome to Martin Van Helden who's uh, with the South Australian Research and Development Institute. Um, Martin's an experienced associate professor with a demonstrated history of working um, in higher education and crop protection in the Netherlands, France and Australia and is skilled in horticulture, viticulture and broad acre farming systems. So Martin, welcome. And I'd also like Thank to introduce much. my colleagues, uh, Doris Blasing, who's our technical expert on the Soil Wealth ICP project, as well as Morag Anderson, who wrote our global scan and review on IPM and drivers in Europe, which is available to you in the handouts pane. So Doris, I'm going to hand to you to run the panel session. We've got some questions coming in from the audience, which I'll hold over and um, pop those into the discussion as we progress. Um, but really looking forward to this next part of the session. Thanks, Doris. And sorry, Doris, I think you're still on mute. How's that? There we go. Oh, that's uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, uh, I found it really interesting. Uh, thanks, Martin and, and Danielle. The, the differences, or not differences, but the different drivers between Europe and in Australia, mainly in Australia, it's driven by the farming industry and obviously in, in Europe, regulation has really taken on this challenge to uh, you know, reduce pesticide use. And just one uh, quick question to uh, Martin in Belgium. Uh, when you listen to Danielle's uh, presentation, is there anything that struck you as interesting? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, 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 that's for sure. It's, it's good to see that um, the um, uh, initiatives are already taken and I was quite uh, um, uh, su surprised as well at the uptake on the, the IPM uh, in, that, uh, in that pie chart you uh, um, showed, uh, Daniel. And also good to see that, that um, uh, in, in Europe it, it well, from history, it's very focused on that uh, crop protection and, and, and pest and disease, but it's it's more, uh, you already take much more in advance. And uh, I'm, I can't say that yet you are maybe well involved. It's good to see that it's not just very narrow, it's quite broadly um, picked up. Um, and a question to Martin in, in Adelaide, I guess that's where you are. Um, from your perspective, having worked obviously in Europe and Australia, what do you see as the major opportunities for the Australian 
vegetable industry specifically, but generally in, in you know, reducing pesticide inputs into crops? Well, I mean, the, 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 the way of reducing pesticides that were quite clearly outlined, I think, by Martin Zouderweijk is, is, yeah, just do your observations, invest the time in that to avoid using too much uh, pesticides. Um, I think it's extremely important that the industry is proactive in this whole procedure. Um, that's something which I saw a big difference between, for example, the Netherlands and France. Uh, initial um, efforts in the Netherlands to reduce pesticide use uh, were in the 1990s, 1995, 1996, if I, my memory is correct. And, and that went quite well with the industry, uh, reducing the tons of pesticides that were being used. That's a 50% production, uh, reduction in the tons of pesticide. Um, whereas in France, where I uh, stayed during, uh, after that period, um, it took much, much longer for the industry to become involved. And the result of that is weirdly that the consumer um, reaction to pesticide in France is now so negative that the farmers are actually suffering from what we call agro bashing. The consumer is basically saying you should not use any pesticides and, and the farmers are then almost impossible, uh, not able to, to respond to that. And even the um, politics in France have become quite extreme. They're one of the leading countries in uh, banning products like uh, glyphosate. So I think it's very important that the industry stays on the steering wheel of these actions. That's a really good point. Thank you for that. So it, um, the point that also Martin made is to get going now. And probably the other important one is to get going together. I know from IPM in, in orchards, it was really important to have a whole region working together rather than only two, uh, two producers just can't do it by themselves. And looking at some how competitive we can be understandably because you know everybody's running a business uh, that might be one challenge that we might have there's there's two elements in that there's um if you have area wide inf area wide information about how important certain pests are in a certain year you can adapt much easier so exchange of information and observations is one thing which i think is extremely useful and the other thing is that if you do that in a group of farmers in the same region, you can actually create a kind of friendly competition in who is best in reducing pesticides. We've done that in France in the viticulture industry, and it turned out at the very start of that action that there was a factor three difference in pesticide use between different uh, vineyards in the same area. So that clearly showed that there was uh, room for improvement. That's a really interesting aspect. I guess, Daniel, you uh, um, hinted to something like that happening. And I wonder, Daniel, whether you have a view on how important the agronomists and advisors are in, in, in this area, because we know that a lot of agronomists actually nearly rely on selling pesticides. So how much on site are they with uh, you know, introducing IPM and ICP? So it, it, you see a very a big difference in regions. So just to, to touch on one of the earlier comments, um, I was just trying to make clear that the, the program at the moment, we are say, seeing a lot of producers who are big advocates of environmental stewardship. And so my expectation is that as we're able to get out and, and engage with um, a different cohort of vegetable producers, we may find that we get a different split um, of the practices that we're capturing. So just to be aware that it does tend to be the lead producers who prioritise environmental stewardship that have got in to this program through a pandemic. So it has been tricky to engage them through 2020 and 2021. Um, but part of what we're looking to do is, is to link those growers through who are identified um, with agronomists that might be able to support them um, I'm unable to show it yet, but there are some very big regional differences. Um, there are one or two states where the practice is vastly different, and that is partly because of the culture of that region and also the crops that they're growing. So there may be specific challenges with, the, with that particular growing condition. Um, and that's true as well with the agronomy services that are available. Um, 
Yeah, depending on the structure of the agronomy service, if there is a if there is a commission built into the sale of product, that does make it very challenging for those agronomists to have that conversation. Um, I do work with agronomists specifically more in the irrigation management side of the business, water use efficiency, and certainly this is something that does come up. Um, at the moment, it's very much around linking them through to those um, advisors that have capability in that space to help them and support them through implementation of this, this approach. Thanks, Tanya. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and in, in some areas, my impression is that uh, the key leading uh, vegetable producers are ahead in their knowledge of some agronomists. I, I'm always surprised when we run our master classes about the depth of knowledge, especially the, the on-farm on agronomists have that are working with the big companies. So, um, and I'm also very heartened by how they're sharing information. So I'm sure we can build on that and Environment is a really good vehicle to do that. Uh, Carl, do you want to go so, to any um, questions from the audience? Yeah, great maybe, to do that. Oh, maybe sorry, Carl, Mark, you Boris, um, if I can uh, hook into that, uh, to the expertise of these uh, uh, agronomists, I, I think here it's a clear example that the leading companies made ICP or IPM uh, part of their strategy yeah, and, and invested in uh, in, in education, invest in training, but also invested in people who take the lead inside the, the company to, to further develop it. So, um, yeah. And also, Martin, thinking about between the, the, the Dutch and, and, and France, um, uh, I, I said it uh, maybe too much even, but uh, the Dutch industry, it's pretty cooperative and and uh, it, it's less now but in the past everything was shared among uh, growers because well they all brought it to the same auction and so there was no competition in in the the, the sales part of their products <clears throat> and and that was the i think the, the the drivers also to to speed up the whole process of change in in into ipm and uh, if we as a uh, a certain crop or region can do that. It, it's also um, helping selling your product towards the consumers. If the consumers say, well, these uh, tomatoes from France or Germany, uh, we don't want because that, that because that, that's, that happened in Spain, for example, uh, where they had an issue with um, a, uh, an illegal residue on peppers. And then Europe said, well, we don't need Spanish peppers anymore. Well, that cost them a fortune. So, uh, and at that time, while well, the Spanish growers were forced within six months to change into IPM, well, that's that's a job, uh, and you never want to be in such a position as a grower. But of course, uh, you don't want to be in a position to uh, be on the blacklist of uh, your consumers. Yes, scandals and and big incidents and things like that are clearly not what you would like to have as the reason to change. And unfortunately, it has happened in a in a number of yeah. cases. Um, yeah. Even in the Netherlands, I think things like spider mite control in greenhouses and orchards to different spider mites, but there was basically no pesticide working anymore. So we had to do something different. And that's how famously copper started uh, when they found out that there was something like called a, a predatory mite. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point, Martin. Uh, similar to um, uh, Brazil is leading in uh, cover crop use in the world and i asked why that is and i said they actually uh, that was the only option they used um, herbicides and, and pesticides so much uh, that nothing worked anymore so they had to learn how to use other methods we don't really want to go there so hopefully we can uh, change more slowly towards you know and, and, and use the approach uh, you know choose your battles and and you know start somewhere small and learn about it and take uh, take the advisors and with us, and I think it's a really good message, Martin, about that the companies who especially lead in IPM and also maybe the use of biological products might really be on a winner. Yeah, even in the Netherlands, I think that was actually even earlier in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Some of the big supermarket chains were starting to grow under contracts uh, with 
I don't know, uh, orange growers in, in Spain, and they started to advertise on that, that they were able to sell oranges that had less pesticide use, and that already entered into the consumer's mind. Mm. Yeah, it's certainly, um, I'm from Germany, so I'm certainly in the 80s, that already happened to consumers looked at the use of pesticides and the origin of, of uh, produce. Some fantastic discussion there around the drivers, both regulatory loss of chemical control and, and social license to operate. Um, going to one of the questions from the audience now, um, Martin, in the Netherlands, you, you mentioned the, the yield increase of 20 to 30 per cent um, as one of the benefits of transitioning to, to IPM or ICP. Within your success pie in motivation, how much is that yield increase driving change or, or getting growers engaged to make the transition? Uh, in the beginning, not because you don't know how much yield increase you will uh, will have. But once you uh, see or uh, you, you see the benefits at your peer farm farmer, well then you see it will uh, accelerate into the crop. Just and and as an example, I can. Um, talk about uh, rose growing in California. It's not Europe, but it's just a perfect example. Uh, if you grow roses, then you have six cuttings a year. And uh, when they uh, 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 stopped using the harsh chemicals, they could have instead of six, seven cuttings a year. But also the stems who are always sold per centimeter length, so the longer the more money, they were 10 centimeters longer. So it was a no-brainer for growers once they have seen the pioneers having success for one or two years and they thought, okay, there's not too much risk on that. Well, they all moved immediately. It's, it's the famous hockey stick, or I know it's not hockey, it's, it's the adaption curve. Eh? You have the early adapters or the pioneers and then suddenly everyone follows. Yeah. Mm, and and, that, and that helped at that time the rose business uh, in in uh, in California. Later on, yeah, it was um, overruled by the uh, import from Colombia and Ecuador. Okay, yeah. And Danielle, the, in the Australian context, that discussion around yields, are you finding that a, a motivation for growers uh, through Enviroveg? Some of the really strong um, proponents of IPM, I think got into it for other reasons. Um, I've had many discussions with growers who have adopted this approach and worked through all the challenges of adopting this system. Um, and I have spoken to a number of them to say, if we could just capture your story and the, the learnings and the mistakes that were made, so that others don't need to go through that process. There are some, like, there are some challenges and there are some skills to be developed to put the system in place so that you don't have any sort of little speed bumps along the way. Um, so that's certainly something that sort of I've spoken about. I think, I, I'm not sure that I'm able to answer the question any better than that, Carl, I'm sorry. No, thanks, Danielle. Can I make a remark on that? Absolutely, thanks, Martin. We actually a farmer should not be interested in his yield. He should be interested in his profit and his personal satisfaction. And that's where we can also drive IPM. Yes, and, and um, my comment is, as, as part of the project that we are involved in, we hear a lot from producers who've changed basically their soil management and through that and, and cover cropping and, and interest in, in different soil management finding that they can reduce uh, fertilizers and they can reduce pesticide use by starting with the soil. So that's probably a really good message. Like we last week we ran the um, soil biology masterclass and it was fascinating to hear from some of the leading growers of what they have achieved. Uh, so we have probably some good news stories that we just have to share a bit wider and make sure people if, if um, Martin says, you know, choose your battles to look actually at soil health might be a good starting point. And, and I think that this is uh, uh, probably one of the easier um, uh, steps you, you can take. Uh, and then of course, there's a lot unknown about the metarhysiums, about the bacillus, about the tragodermas you could put in, but 
in Africa, we have uh, uh, the, the farmers are using those products in the soil or even use uh, products to feed the beneficial fungi in the soil. Eh? So it's not just bringing in the beneficial fungi, but also feeding it. Um, yeah, it, that, that makes huge differences. And, and, and then you see better crops. And of course, Martin, uh, yield is one, profit is a second one. Uh, but a healthy crop is, is uh, um, uh, uh, keeping away the, 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 the invaders, invaders uh, uh, quite well. But of course, it's all about the number under the line. Uh, but we should take into account that, that also uh, we need to be able or we have the, the license to produce later on. And then that number can be uh, quite red if, if we are not able to. So, uh, yeah. Mm. And Martin, Danielle briefly touched on some of the challenges uh, that she's identified through discussions with growers here in Australia. I'm just wondering in the European context of that really forced transition and quite uh, quick, what some of the main challenges have been and, and perhaps you're foreseeing between now and, and 2030 with that uh, horizon? Well, what we... Uh, um Pace here is that if you have less uh, um, products to you to to use, then or the pesticides that are, will be used are more selective, or, or herbicides or fungicides, yeah, then uh, we see that secondary pests will uh, pop up, and for these secondary pests, which normally were uh, covered by these broad spectrum uh, uh, pesticides, yeah, it's, it's something. Uh, um, new and and then often the secondary pests are um very crop specific and therefore uh, sometimes if if the, the the business model or the business case is then too small uh, it's hard to to get the funding or, or hard to to find the the resources to uh, to develop so new pest is is uh, certainly um uh, one thing that 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 will be the challenge mm. And Martin in Adelaide, was there any additional comments to that from your experience in other industries as well, outside of uh, perhaps horticulture? Um, yeah, it's, it's it's. I think the the main issue is still that the farmers need to pick up the challenge and see that there's a positive challenge. Um, it's, it's, as long as it is an, an, a negative push to reducing pesticide, that, that's not a very interesting message to work on. Um, and um, I can give the example of, of work I did in France where we looked into planting hedgerows to stimulate beneficials in viticulture. Um, it was picked up even in the very high value vineyards um, where the cost can be absorbed, that's easy of course, but I mean a, a hectare of vineyards in those areas will cost you something like one and a half million Australian dollars. So that's quite expensive land, I would say. Um, but it was still picked up. And, and sometimes you can have some unexpected spin-off. Uh, it turned out that we attracted one beneficial very efficiently there, which was actually the viticultural tourist. He liked the landscape we were creating. That brought in some extra money for the farmers. Mm. No, interesting point. Um, look, I'd like to just pause there, given time. We're, we're almost at our hour and I'm conscious uh, people, including our presenters, have other commitments. But I'd like to thank uh, Martin Zerdewick, uh, Martin Van Helden and Danielle Park, uh, our presenters and panellists today, and also to Doris Blasing and Laura Ganderson for, for running the panel session. That's been hugely useful, very interesting and some great insights there from overseas and um, talking about them in the Australian context. Before we do finish up, just a, a reminder around some additional resources and events to support people on their ICP journey. Um, at soilwealth.com.au, the website, we've got a range of best practice guides, case studies um, and global scans, including the one in your handouts pane there to take away with you today. We really appreciate your involvement and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much.
It was. Oh, no, thank you.